I am deeply overcome here tonight because um, the Nixon family, especially President Nixon, was so gracious to me. He was a wonderful man, and we, over the years, established a close bond and relationship. So tonight, I am overwhelmed at being here, first of all, and I'm so pleased that uh, a number of my friends and longtime colleagues uh, have been, have come here tonight to witness whatever it is that I'm doing here. <laughs> I have, um, I've come a long way. Uh, as many of you who know me and those of you who don't know me, I grew up in North Carolina, uh, raised by my grandmother, who was a very saintly woman who believed in me, even when it was very difficult in our life in North Carolina growing up in the kind of situation that we grew up. We were very poor. We had nothing. But my grandmother always told me, she said, don't ever tell anybody you have nothing because you always have God with you. And if you got God with you, you got everything. And she told me that over and over again. And so as my life evolved over the years, even as a young boy and as a young man, I found out that she was right. And I just continued to let the good Lord use me because that's what she told me. She said, Bobby, just let the Lord use you. Let him take you where he would have you to go. Let him do what you would, he would want you to do. And I have had an opportunity to travel across the world We've been involved in all kinds of things. Um, I went to Africa and I saw that the children, millions of them had no books. And so I established a book program where we've sent millions of books into different countries, into Nigeria, into South Africa, into other countries across the continent. And we've done other things. We've sent kids to school. Uh, one of them that we sent to school in Nigeria is now a king there. He's coming to see me next week. He'll be in, in the country for two or three weeks. And it just goes back to what I learned early on from my grandmother. And that is that if you let the Lord use you, if you let him have his way with your life, there is no way and no way that you can measure how much you can do and what you can do as a man, as a woman, as a child, or whatever. And so this book has been in me. I've been trying to write this book for the last 20 years at least. I would get, it would start and stop, start and stop. And then I'd get busy on projects in, in different parts of the world and, and uh, or else so some of the companies that I was involved with, they were, going to do a merger and they're going to redo everything and, and I'm heavily involved in that. But I just sat down uh, one day and said, uh, if I leave this earth without writing this book, my grandmother will come and haunt me wherever I am. <laughs> she will not understand that, Bobby, you got to do this. And so you can't go wrong doing right. My grandmother told me that thousands of times because we grew up in a circumstance where as, as blacks in North Carolina and in the South in my hometown, I couldn't go to a fountain and get a drink of water. I couldn't go to a place and get a hot dog. I couldn't do a lot of things. It, at my school where I grew up, I went to grade school and and many times we didn't have any books and those books that we had were raggedy. And I would be wondering why on earth don't we have good books? Because if you saw that many of the other kids in the other school, they all had good books, but we, our books were raggedy and everything. So 
And so one day I went home and I told my grandmother, I was getting really smart, I was in about the third or fourth grade. And I said, Mama, why we have to put up with all these old raggedy books and everything? She said, she looked at me and she said, Bobby, I want to tell you something, boy. She said, whatever's in that book, you get it. Raggedy, torn up, whatever. Piece it back together and get everything in there. And she said, every time you get your hands on a book, you read everything in it. And you go ahead and, and try to use what you read and put it into your life. And always be reaching out to help somebody else, even the other young kids around you. Said, so just reach out and help them. Many of them need help. And so that's what I did. I used my life that way. In grade school, in middle school, in high school, in college, and in my life generally. That's what I've done. And it has taken me where I couldn't even dream that I could go across the world. In, in every part of the world, in the Far East, in Africa, in Europe, and in, in all over Asia. And so tonight, I want to thank everybody who's had a, a chance to be here and to be involved for being here. I want to thank uh, the Nixon Library staff and board and everybody connected with this institution for setting this up and for having me here because I love the Nixon family. I love President Nixon. He was one of my favorite people in the world. And I told him when he was, had all the problems, it seemed like the whole world was coming on him. And I saw him at one point, I came out here and I visited with him. He was ill and, and I said, I want to tell you something, Mr. President. I am with you, and if you need me, I'm going to stay with you. I'm not going to abandon you because that's not in my spirit. I don't do things like that. That's not in my life. And he kind of teared up a little bit, and he said, Bob, I appreciate you, and I thank you so much. He said, this has meant so much to me. And so as soon as he was able, I called him one day, and I told him, I said, we're getting together a, a testimonial kind of thing for you in New York. And he said, you know, Bob, I'm not doing that anymore. I can't do that. I said, well, this one you have to do because a lot of people want to get together and thank you for all that you've done. And so he said, well, let me talk to Mrs. Nixon about this. Let me, let me just think about it. And uh, I said, well, I'll call you the next couple of days. I'll call him back. And he said, well, I will do it. He said, but you know, I haven't done anything like this in, in a long time. He said, I've just been getting my stuff together, writing a little bit, getting my thoughts together. I said, well, you'll enjoy this because everybody coming to this function will, will be ready to thank you for all that you have done for all of us and for America and for the world. He came. And he delivered, he came to New York, and he delivered. It was his first speech that he did after he had been sick and everything else. But he came, and he delivered one of the most thought-provoking speeches that I'd ever heard from him. And I heard him speak a lot over the years. And so I'm here tonight to say thank you to President Nixon and Mrs. Nixon and the Nixon family for all that they've done. All of us make mistakes. And you know, I'd like for everybody in here to raise their hand who hadn't made any mistakes in their life. <laughs> you know, well, we have one. <laughs> but uh, I know, and I've been around in this spirit long enough to know that, that I know I've made some myself. And, um, but President Nixon was a wonderful man. And he did some things for this country that no other president has done in the past, or had done in the past, 
Oh, none have done, have even matched him in these years since. And I've written about many of them in my book, and many of them uh, uh, conversation pieces, pieces wherever I go that we talk about. But tonight, I just want to say that uh, I'm grateful for all of you being here. I'm grateful that uh, President Nixon was in my life. He made a difference to my life. And in turn, I tried to use what he gave me to make a difference in many thousands, and if not millions of other lives, not only in America, but in other parts of the world, because that's what it's all about. As my grandmother told me over and over again, she said, number one, you can't help somebody else without helping yourself. She said, it's not possible. And she said, what your life ought to be about is finding ways how you can raise others up, how you can help everybody that you can help. She said, that's what the Lord put you on this earth for, not just to line your pockets or get as much as you can or be as greedy as you can be, but to reach out and help our fellow men and women in this nation. So tonight, I'm calling on all of us to regroup and our prayers for our country and for all the people in it, and for us to come together as a nation, as a people, more than we have ever done before in our lives. We have a lot of work to do. We have all these young people who are coming in after us, and they need guidance, they need hope. They are looking out there for you and I and everybody else to give them some hope and some leadership. And that's what we ought to be doing with our lives. None of us are going to be here forever. Some of us act like we're going to live forever. Never going to be a time when they're going to have a funeral for us. I got news for you. All of us are going to leave here sooner or later. And I think we all need to be thinking about how much good we can do. And so I'm happy to see you all here tonight. I'm happy that uh, the Nixon Library and the board would think enough of me to bring me here and to get this gathering together and for me to explain to you how grateful I am to live in America and to be an American and to support my country with everything that's in me. And we have to come together. This country is divided now as much or more than I've ever seen it in different ways. We can't afford that. We are all one, and we should all be for one, and we should all be for one another. And we've got to do that. We've got to rekindle that spirit, not only among young people, but people all over America and indeed all over the world. We've got to let them know that America is the greatest country on the face of the earth, and we're gonna show everybody by showing them how much togetherness there is in this country to lift everybody up, no matter where you are, who you are, how poor you are, how rich you are, that we are together. And if we're gonna save our country, we're gonna save our children, and we're gonna continue down the road, the road of lifting each other up. So thank you so much uh, for being here. And thank you for your support, your love, and your friendship. And let's keep it together. Let's keep it going. Because we have, we've, we've discovered that we are the greatest nation on earth. And we want to remain that. And we can't remain that without God's help. And we can't remain that without us being together as a people no matter who you are, no matter how poor you are, what color you are, no matter how rich you are, or how much power you think you have. My grandmother used to tell me, Bobby, that all power rests in the good Lord. She said, everything you get comes from him. And so we have to be together. We have to show that higher power that we love our nation, we love our people and we want to keep this thing going. 
So God bless you all, and I hope that we have a great evening here this evening, and I look forward to shaking everybody's hand when we're finished. Well, this is a great uh, honor for me to, uh, to be able to talk to Bob briefly tonight. Uh, this, uh, it's rare that you find a book, I think, my experience, where you uh, feel with each page you're really uh, inhabiting the author and following uh, the course of the story uh, in, a, in a real visceral way. Uh, it's, it's even more unusual that it, uh, when you turn the last page, you wish there were more because you want to get to know the author better. And uh, that's, that's what I found uh, in this book. It's, uh, the subject matter is important. Uh, the portraits are vivid. Uh, the psychology is insightful. And it's also very entertaining. There's a lot of great stories. So in the brief time, uh, we've, uh, Bob has come out to spend a couple of days with us here at the uh, foundation of the library in Yorba Linda, so naturally we've been working him. Uh, today, uh, already today, a board meeting, a working lunch, a graduate seminar at Chapman, uh, an afternoon event tonight, and then tomorrow uh, he'll be doing a, uh, an oral history with us, and then uh, one of Jonathan Mavroidis' uh, weekly Nixon Now podcasts that will be up next Monday. So, uh, and then a couple of events at uh, uh, UC Irvine. So, uh, you're singing for your supper. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we do want uh, time for questions. And in the podcast and in the oral history, uh, I think you'll go into some depth about the, uh, the accomplishments of Richard Nixon, the Nixon administration, and yours, and how uh, not only did they make a difference in from 1969 to 1972 uh, and beyond, but that they're still very much uh, around and alive today in 2019 and affecting the lives of people. So, uh, but for tonight and just in 25 minutes to give a sense of the range of your life and experience, I want to do uh, just do a 30,000 foot uh, view. So let's start with, I, I know you and, and uh, I know you, you saw Martin Luther King for the first time in 1959, I think when you went to a, uh, a speech or a sermon he gave in New York. That's right. But then uh, cut, uh, flash forward four years, you're in Atlanta, you are working and you're making a success of your <clears throat> public relations firm that you had always wanted to go out on. Before we do that, the, uh, the, 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 uh, one makes one's own luck, but Bob's career has been uh, taken turns that were, could not have been expected. And it's not just luck, it's maybe fate or maybe, as I'm sure, your grandmother would say more than that. But tell the story. You've gone to a couple of, you've gone to, you graduated from college, but you had to go home in order to help her. Uh, and, and, and to go home from Richmond, your then girlfriend, soon to be wife, had to sell her portable typewriter just to get you the train ticket from Richmond to uh, High Point, North Carolina. So it was a tough, uh, uh, business, to set up your own business in those days. But uh, to go back, you uh, graduated from college, you don't know quite what you want to do, and someone comes and knocks on the door, and from that you become a policeman. How did, uh, what was, what was, how did that happen? Well, first of all, uh, when, when I graduated from high school, I had uh, several scholarships to Quaker the Society of Friends, the Quakers, gave me a, a scholarship, which they said I earned. I made a, uh, made a speech that uh, at my high school, which was founded by the Quakers in the South, in North Carolina, in the Greensboro High Point area, as where the Quakers were strongest in America. They're still, the Guilford College is still there that they founded and a lot of other things. And so every year they gave a scholarship. It was $150 to the graduating senior who was a member of the Honor Society. If you wrote it, you had to write it and, and give the oration yourself uh, to an assembly, an, an assembly. And then there would usually be three, four, five students. And I was one of them. 
And I wrote this speech. And um, the speech started off something like this. This was in 1954. Uh, ours is a war-weary world with mature, material and moral destruction and disintegration all about us. Millions of men and women are discouraged, apathetic, without much hope for the future. Others are cynical, disillusioned, and bitter because the legacy of wars has left a heavy burden of fatigue, distress, and discouragement on our nation. That's the way I started my speech in 1954 when I graduated from high school. I don't know how I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I won that scholarship, and then the Elks were giving away a scholarship, and I developed uh, my speech on that, and I won that. So I, I had $300. And plus, I had different schools were giving me scholarships, uh, but uh, the residual was too much. So I knew that I was not going to be able to overcome that. And uh, I finally got a scholarship from Virginia Union University. And one thing led to another. So I went there, and I did very well. I made good grades. And uh, so after uh, we were coming back home, and I knew that I was going to have to stay home. I wasn't going to be able to go back to college that, that year unless I did it in, in Greensboro at A&T, where I could just thumb a ride and get over there. So my grandfather and grandmother were ill. So I wanted to get back home, and my girlfriend, who was going to Hampton, Sally, who I was married, and we were together until she passed away. We were together 47 years as, as a couple. And uh, she came through Richmond and said that we should get the train home. Well, I didn't have any money to get the train. I mean, I thought I was going to have to throw them down the high point from Richmond. And so she said, uh, I said, you have any money? She said, I got a few dollars. And uh, then she had this typewriter, a uh, very nice portable typewriter. You know, they had very few of those made back then. And I said, you got that typewriter? I said, let me see if I can get some money for that typewriter. <laughs> so I took that typewriter to the pawn shop in Richmond, Virginia, and I pawned it for enough money to get both of us tickets back to High Point from Richmond on the train. Now, I was on the train, the railroad company, the Southern Railroad. I later became a member of the Board of Rectors of Norfolk Southern. And through all of that and all the things that my late wife saw me do, and, and she saw me do everything. She went to the White House with me and everybody else. Uh, but she would always ask me, she said, Robert, when are you going back to Richmond to try to find a typewriter to get you on to get up home? <laughs> so I never got the typewriter. I, could, I didn't remember the pawn shop that I put it in or anything else. But it was, it was always uh, uh, things that, that I would do with her and that I would do with my family that I would try to do it uh, to help not just me, but I wanted to help everybody. One of my friends told me one time, uh, we were uh, around playing a stick ball or something, and kids would come up and ask me, Bobby, you got a nickel? And I, maybe I'd have 15 cents, I'd give him a nickel. And he said, man, why are you trying to give everybody something? You don't have nothing yourself. Why are you trying to give it to everybody? I said, well, my grandmother always told me that it doesn't belong to me. It belongs, everything belongs to God. She said, if you give liberally, she said, the Lord will take care of you and take you so high board you can't even believe. And I, you know, I believe my grandmother because she was a, a good woman who tried to help everybody. And so I just stuck with that philosophy. I went to Virginia Union for a year. I made very good grades and most straight A's. And uh, then I came home and my grandparents were ill, and I stayed home with them. And I went to A&T, North Carolina A&T, and I made excellent grades there. Uh, but uh, after that, I knew that I had to go to work. I had to get a job somewhere. I had to do something. 
And I was just trying to determine what I was supposed to do. And then one night uh, I saw where they were giving a, a police exam. And I said, well, I'm finishing up the rest of the year with my sociology. And we were studying police relationships with communities. And so I took the exam and uh, then I wrote a paper on it. I got an A plus on it from uh, my professor. And uh, later on, uh, uh, about 10 days later, uh, I'm at home when I get home one evening and my grandmother tells me that the police have been by my house looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out what on earth is going on. She said, Bobby, you're not in any trouble, are you? I said, no, ma'am, mama, I'm not in any trouble. I don't know what they want. And so he had left a number on a card, and I went across the street to call him because we didn't have a telephone. So I called him, and uh, he said, uh, I want to come down there and see you, uh, Mr. Brown, and uh, I'll be down there in a few minutes. Are you going to be around? I said, yes, sir. So I went back across the street on my old porch, and I sat there on the porch and waited for him until he came. I didn't know what the police wanted with me. You know, I had not in any trouble. So he came, and he rolled up, and he, he got out of his car, and I went out and shook his hand, and I said, yes, sir. I said, uh, have I had any trouble? Have I done anything? He said, no, you, not, you haven't done anything. He said, uh, you took that a police exam, and you made the highest mark anybody's ever made on that thing. We want to offer you a job. <laughs> so I said, oh, my Lord Jesus, what on earth is happening now? So, so anyway, uh, I, I ended up taking the job. And I stayed on the job for two years. And during that time, I got married to my girlfriend, who had been my girlfriend from the fifth grade. And um, uh, we got married, and uh, she got a job. And uh, then, next thing I know, I've been assigned to work on some, with some federal narcotic agents who were in the region. And my chief assigned me to work with them. Well, I worked with them, and we, we, we caught a whole bunch of people that, you know, because I directed where they should go and how they should be doing it. And then when we finished that, uh, they told me that they wanted to, uh, me to be an agent with the Bureau. And I said, well, I have to have a college degree, and I only had two years of college. They said, well, it's not going to mean anything with you because we're going to call, uh, we're going to get in touch with the commissioner, and we get the paper. You sign all these papers and fill everything out, and we'll get back to you. So I did that. And uh, next thing I know, my grandmother, a few weeks later, my grandmother called me. She, she called the police station, and she said, hey, Bobby, to come back here. I need to talk to him. So I went by my grandmother's house, and my grandmother said, boy, you're not in any trouble, are you? <laughs> I said, no, ma'am, Mom, I'm not in any trouble. She said, well, everybody's saying the FBI is investigating me. <laughs> so I had to go on and fess up and tell her what was going on, you know. And, uh, and uh, a couple of weeks after that, they sent me a letter saying that from the commissioner himself, saying that I had been appointed as a federal agent and I would support the 90 Church Street at the federal building in New York to the district supervisor and so forth. So Sal and I lifted up. I resigned from the police department and went there. And I worked there for a little more than three years. And I was, uh, I, I think I was one of the top agents because the, the biggest cases in the Bureau during that time, I had something to do with them, including the Vero Genovese case, which was the biggest mafia case ever held in the world. There were 18 defendants there, and several of those defendants were mine that I had made cases of. And then they sent me to Canada to work with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They sent me all over. They figured I was a trophy guy here, you know, they go to send me. So anyway, my life just devolved into all of that. And one one uh, night there, you are being modest, you were a very successful agent. One night, uh, you're asked uh, to take a young uh, congressional staff aide on a uh, ride around. 
and uh, particularly for a drug buy. And uh, that was how you met Robert F. Kennedy. That's right. It, uh, uh, I, had, I had met him uh, once before, and um, he called the bureau and he asked them, uh, did they have an agent who was working on the mafia who they could do the surveillance on? And they appointed me to do that. I was at the cases, so I took them on a merry-go-round. He followed me all, all the evening, and we got to know each other, and one thing happened after another. Then his brother ran for president, and uh, I got involved in that with uh, Jack Kennedy, and then one thing after that, uh, Bobby Kennedy after the killings and all that stuff, Bobby Kennedy just, and after Martin Luther King Jr. had been killed, he came down to Atlanta and we saw each other there. And uh, he asked me, look, uh, you know, I want to be president. I want to, you know, I want you to work with me. And so I agreed and two months later, he's gone, he's killed. And then later on, I see Clarence Towns who worked with Ray Bliss, the head of the Republican Party, and he asked me to work with him. He said, you know, I'm working with, with Mr. Nixon. We're trying to get him elected president. I said, man, I don't want to get involved in it. I said, everybody I touch is dying. I said, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to get involved in that stuff anymore. Now, uh, uh, again, the role of sort of the world of Bob Brown. Uh, Dr. King has been killed. You've had the meeting with Robert Kennedy and thinking about joining his campaign. He's killed. So you are, you, you don't think that you can, that you want to transfer your enthusiasm to Vice President Humphrey, so you don't quite know what you're going to do, although you want to be engaged. And you're crossing a street in New York and you run into right. these two people. Okay. And that leads to right. uh, sort of a proposition and then... Uh, it ran into Clarence Towns, who was running a section of the Republican National Committee, who I knew, and uh, one of my other guys. And uh, they wanted me to work with the Republican Party and to get uh, Mr. Nixon elected. And I said, you guys know that I'm a registered Democrat. They said, we don't care nothing about that. We want your contacts and your brain and everything else. <laughs> we care nothing about what party you are. So uh, we talked about it a long time, and I agreed to go with it. And, I, and then I got involved in reading more about uh, Mr. Nixon's background and where he came from. And I liked his spirit and so forth. So I started working with them and one thing led to another and another. And then they had a crisis uh, at one point where many of you may remember that uh, Mr. Humphrey went to upstate New York. I think it was uh, Rochester. Rochester, yes. You remember that? Yeah. And they wouldn't let him in. The demonstrators would not let him in town. He had to get back on his plane and get out of there as fast as he could, which he did. And, and Mr. Nixon was coming there, supposed to be there the next week. He was coming for a rally and a fundraiser. So they called me and asked me, did I know anybody or could I do anything to make sure that he didn't get disturbed like and they figured that if Humphrey got run out of town, you know what's going to happen to Mr. Nixon. You know, they're going to run away from me. Boy. So they called me and said, can you do anything about this? So I said, you know, I can try. You know, I, that's been my life, working with crisis situations. So I flew up there and got to know the players. And there were two brothers there, uh, Benny Brass and his brother. They were two great big uh, black guys who had the hair out like this, and they were both about, about seven feet tall or something. <laughs> I mean, they were literally big guys. Everybody was afraid of them. They ruled everything. <laughs> and so I went to the end and talked to them. I said, you know, here's what I want to do. I gave them a proposal. I said, I want Mr. Nixon in here to do his bidding. I said, I don't care how many demonstrations you put on the side of the street or at the airport put them on the side of the street. I said, I'll help you. I'll find you some more. I'll even buy you some black cars to, to, to have them up there. So I, uh, we worked it out. And uh, Mr. Nixon came on into town, and nobody stopped him. And he had his rally, 
And then he had a fundraiser, and he went back out of town, and nobody stopped him. And he, I think it was Bob Finch that he later asked, who is this, how did this happen? Say Humphrey couldn't get into town, he couldn't get out of the airport, and here he's coming in town with a fundraiser and everything else. And they said, well, we got this guy, Bob Brown, over here. And uh, he worked it out. <laughs> And, and uh, Bob Finch told me that he told him, he said, you find him, that Bob Brown, wherever it is, because I want him on the plane, one of them campaign plays for me, wherever I'm going for the end of the campaign. And so that's how I got connected, really connected with Mr. Nixon and the campaign, and I followed him. And then after the campaign was over, uh, uh, Holloman called me. We were all staying at the Waldorf. And the Haldeman called me the next morning. He said, Bob, get yourself together because we all going down to uh, keep his cane to put the new government together. And uh, I said, well, I can't go. My wife is here. I haven't seen her in I don't know how long. And I said, I don't want a job. I said, I'll do whatever you all need me to do. Uh, but I'll be a consultant because I got to go back to my business and try to make some money. I got to live, man, you know. And uh, he said, OK, I'll tell the old man. So over the next few weeks, I was talking to Ziegler and everybody on the phone constantly. And so one day, Haldeman called me. they in New York by this time at the Piero. And Haldeman says, uh, Bob, your old man wants to see you right now, right now. I said, well, I'll be up that way tomorrow, Bob. I got some client meetings. So I'll be in New York. I said, I'll come by there first so I don't get tied up in it. So I went by there and uh, he met me downstairs, took me up to Mr. Nixon's suite. And he was sitting there talking to Herbert Brownell and Bill Rogers. And uh, we opened, Haldeman opened the door and he saw what was happening. And he said, I'm sorry to disturb you, sir, but I got Bob Brown here and, and we'll wait out of here until you all finish and everything. And uh, Mr. Nixon stood up, I looked at him, he said, Bob, he hollered my name, Bob, come on in here. I, I'm, not, I'm getting rid of these people here. She said, I want you to meet them anyway. <laughs> so I walked in and uh, he said, uh, these guys, this is uh, Bill Rogers, he introduced them. And uh, he said, this is Bob Brown. He said, he did some great work for me during the campaign and he's going to be one of my top assistants in the White House. Now, we hadn't even had a conversation <laughs> before the White House, but that's what he said. So what am I going to be? I'm going to be stupid and say, I ain't going to do it. No. No, I said, and I, I always liked him, and I loved him as a man, as a human being. And uh, so he said, uh, he, he put everybody out of the room, including Hallman. So it was only two of us there. And he said, I just want to talk to you. I said, he said, I got a lot of things on my mind. And we talked about everything. We talked about his years with Eisenhower, what happened there, what happened with black people, and what was going on in the country with black people, and what he wanted to do, and what he wanted to see for administration. And he said, uh, I want you to do all of this. He said, you know more about this than I do. And he said, you have total access. He said, don't worry about it. He said, I've been there. I know about not having access and being on the outside. You and, were skeptical, uh, though, weren't you? You were flattered, of course, you would be, but uh, that, it, that, that access is easier promised, and especially before you're actually inaugurated, than delivered. So you, uh, I think you say that you. Uh, but I, I, I decided that strategically, since he asked me that way and he really wanted me to do it, uh, that I should do it for a year. And I told him, I said, you know, I'll come and help get everything organized and I'll be, after that, I'll be for a year and I'll be a consultant, he said. He just shook his head, he didn't say anything, you know. <laughs> so anyway. Tell the story of uh, Roy Wilkins, who was the head of the NAACP, uh, was very skeptical about your access to the president. So oh, <laughs> tell that story. It's a very good one. Yeah. All, uh, I think, uh, many of the civil rights issues, except uh, Dr. King Sr., because I was with them. But the rest of them, like Roy and all of them, they were just, uh, 
you know, they didn't believe that I would have access and that Mr. Nixon, they didn't know whether he would trust me and that I had known him for 20 years. And so uh, uh, he was, Roy had a problem, he had several different problems. And uh, there were some things going on in different communities that he wanted to set right uh, in Mississippi and other places. And uh, he said he wanted to see uh, uh, the president. So the president was going to see him, but the president wanted me to talk to him, and which I did. In fact, Rosemary called me and told me to come over to the Oval Office. The president was going to step in the out of office somewhere, and he wanted me to sit in here and talk to Roy while he was in there. I knew what he was doing. He wanted me to find out what Roy was wanting. So I found out everything he wanted, and, uh, and I told him that we would take care of it and so forth. So when the president came back in, the president just said, you know, uh, you talked to Bob. And Roy said, yeah, Bob is going to do this. You know, I said, yeah. So after that, the relationship flourished. Because every time there was a problem anywhere, you know, they would call me, and I would press the buttons and make something happen. And um, so it, it, it turned out well for the administration. And it turned out well for, for the all of the, for Wilkins and the NAACP, because I had a relationship with all of them. I knew all of them. I had marched with them. I had been to jail with them. I, you know, I knew all of them. So there was nothing that they could say to me about this is happening. I knew all of that. So I've been to Alabama, Mississippi, and everywhere else. And you had been in the, in the inner circles of uh, the Dr. King's uh, life, and particularly the uh, Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference, uh, when he, the day he was assassinated, you, he had asked you to be in Atlanta waiting for him to come back from Memphis because he wanted to talk to you about projects that you were working on. And uh, you get word that morning that he is going to be, uh, the situation in Memphis is much more difficult, so he's not going to be able to get away. Yeah. You're driving home to High Point. I was waiting for him in his office because uh, his executive assistant had called me it's the day before and said, Martin wants to see you. He's got a bunch of things on his mind that he needs to talk to you about right away. So I said, I'll come down there and wait on him to come back from Memphis. So I'm sitting in his office waiting on him. He calls up and he said, I'm not coming back, Bob. I'm going, uh, I've got to stay here. They want me to speak again tonight. I said, okay, I'll go home and then we'll get together the next few days. So I go out and catch a plane to Charlotte, which was the closest thing to High Point. At, at that time, I would have had to wait for late in the evening to get another flight. So I got a plane to Charlotte. And as soon as I got the plane in Charlotte, uh, Everybody was, airport was in, it was pandemonium. Everybody was running there, which, and I'm trying to stop people. I, asked, I thought there was a bomb somewhere or something. I'm asking people, what in the world is going on? Nobody wants to talk. So uh, in a few minutes, this guy comes by, this black guy rolling, uh, uh, he was a sky cap, and he's rolling that little buggy you put uh, bags on. And I asked him, I said, man, what is going on in this airport? He said, he looked at me, he said, Man, don't you know they just killed Martin Luther King Jr.? I'm trying to figure out, am I, is, this, is the world going to the end of what, coming to the end of what is happening? And so I went on and then I found a telephone, you know, there weren't no cell phones. Right? So I found one of the telephones on the wall and I picked it up and I called my house. And Sally, my late wife, she was crying. And I heard all this noise in the background. There were a lot of people in my house. That's, and, uh, she said, Robert, where on earth are you? She said, they just killed Dr. King. And I told her what I'd done, and that I'd just talked to him. And, and uh, I told her I would get a, rent a car and drive home. And, and uh, then while I'm driving home that evening, uh, I mean, I turned the radio on and there's violence and killing everywhere, the opposite of what Martin was about. And that was, that was one of the longest nights of my life. And then you get home, 
and you get a call from Coretta Scott King who wants you to come back to Atlanta because uh, Nelson Rockefeller, who was governor of New York, had sent his private plane right. to bring her to Memphis to bring Dr. King's body back. So you meet her at the, meet her at the I, Atlanta airport? I met her at the Atlanta airport. Uh, and then we had uh, four or five other people to go with us. I think Andy Young was there and Harry Belafonte and, and uh, several people like that, and a couple of staff people. And we went to pick up Martin's body. And um, she, we talked on the plane for a little bit. And she said, Bob, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. She was just devastated. So when we got to Memphis, we, uh, the uh, garbage workers union guys met us at the airport. And they said, they asked King, uh, Mrs. King, uh, that, I know you've come here to get Mark, but I know Mark was going to march with us. And they were just saying, you got to march and so forth. So Coretta looks at me and she said, Bob, what should we do? I said, we're going to march. But I said, as soon as we finish this march, we are marching right back to this plane and with Martin's body, putting his body on the plane, we're going back to uh, Atlanta, which is what we did. We marched for a short distance and then, because we had his children there, and just crowds of people, and it was a bad, a very bad, bad time, very bad time. To, uh, because time is, is uh, very short, uh, many years later, I think in 1986, you get another call from her, uh, from Coretta Scott King, asking that she's, been, she's going to South Africa and she would like you to go with her. So you go, this is all in the book, this is so, I'm gonna compress this, but you go with her and at that point, uh, she doesn't, uh, you meet Winnie Mandela, but you don't get to meet uh, Nelson Mandela. You go back another time and you become the first person to go into Polesmore prison for uh, two hours um, and uh, the first of visits. Uh, well, and he, which you describe very vividly in the book. Mm -hmm. What's it like seeing this man who has been in prison for th 23 years at that point? Um, I was, I was taken aback. He, um, uh, we went to see Ms. Mandela at the old house and Ms. Mandela, uh, Coretta asked Ms. Mandela, look, uh, what is it that we can do to help you? She said, what we want, what Nelson and I want, and we've always wanted, but nobody would ever follow through, is we want our children to come to America and go to school and get an education so they can be good leaders and they can do this. And um, so uh, Coretta looks at me and she said, Bob, is that something we can do? I said, I will do it, Coretta. I said, all Mrs. Mandela has to do is write me a letter and I will take care of it. I'll take care of everything. I'll take care of her, I'll take care of the children. I will do everything to make their life easier. So I did all that. I brought them to America, sent them to Boston University. You became their legal everything. guardian. Became their legal guardian, ever paid for everything. And it cost a lot of money because I got them a house, I got them a van, and I took care of them going back and forth to Africa to see her mother and just lots of things. But I was already doing lots of things for SCLC and for this and that, you know. I had to work a little harder, you know, to lift my income up a little bit more. Uh, but that was a, that was a very difficult time. But that was that was nothing but God leading me, uh, and I see it now, you know. And when I look back, I see that that's what was happening. He had opened all these doors for me, and then all of a sudden, I look up, and I'm. Not only does uh, President Borta's right-hand man call me in my hotel before I leave the, the uh, hotel to come back to America that, uh, the next morning, he calls me and says, uh, Mr. Brown, my name is Neil Van Hurden. That was his name. And uh, he said, I'm an assistant to President Borta. And President Borta is granting you permission 
to go inside Posmore Prison to see Mr. Mandela tomorrow morning if you still want to do it. What do you mean if I still want to? Nobody had seen Mandela in 20 some years. They didn't even know how Mandela looked. There were no pictures. And he wouldn't know if I still want to do it. I said, yeah. And so I went down there. And I was a little bit skittish. Because there were guns. I went to the gate and the guns up top everywhere. I mean, you know. And those guys were big guys with those guns. And, and uh, they said, halt, and the guns up like this. And, and uh, I said, my name is Bob Brown. And I had my passport up like so they could see, you know, it was one of the same. And the guy looked at my passport, he says, oh, Mr. Brown, he said, open the gate. So they opened the gate. And he said, you go to that brick building right up there and somebody will meet you. So I went up to that brick building. And when I got up there, the door opened, bam, just like that. Like somebody was, I said, oh, Lord, I know I'm gone now, you know. <laughs> So it was the warden. He was a great big tall Africana guy and with braids on his hat. And he comes out of the door and he stretches his hand out to me. He said, Mr. Brown, we are so happy to see you here at Polmore Prison. He said, I'm the chief warden here and I'm already sent for Mr. Mandela and they are bringing him down from his cell now. He said, you go in that room right there and you stay in there with him as long as you want to. He said, we're grateful to you for doing what you're doing for him and his family. That's what the Africana guy told me. Now I knew this was nothing but God. I knew it, you know. So when I go, Mandela comes down and we hug and you know, I'm, tears are coming out of my eyes because here's Nelson Mandela, he's been in prison for 20 some years. And nobody's even thinking about him. So it's only God could bring me in there. So I go in there and he starts talking to me about forgiveness. He starts talking to me about the only thing necessary for the triumph of South Africa as a nation is for the good white people and the good black people to come together. Here's a man talking about this and they had destroyed many of his family, and killed them. And he's talking about bringing everybody together. I, I don't know whether my faith would have been quite that strong where I could have done it like that. Because they had killed all his friends around him and they had treated his family dirt. They had put Winnie in exile and jail and his children were scattered. And then this man is talking to me about forgiveness. So I knew it wasn't up but God which had me inside that prison. You know, and so I just, I, I, I told him what I was doing. He thanked me for what I was doing for his family and everything. And so I kind of eased in there and kept in touch and took care of his family, went in, all of them. Uh, but then one day, the biggest thing that happened after that, it was like a month or two later, I'm back in South Africa for something. And I'm staying at a hotel in Cape Town. And I was out in a meeting, then I came back to my hotel. As soon as I got back in my room, somebody said, bam, 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 on the door. So someone who's hitting my door like this. So I peeped out that people, you know, all had that peephole there. I peeped out that peephole. And it was two great big white guys standing outside my door, dressed. And I said, who are you? What do you want? They said, we're from President Border's office. I said, President Border? He said, yeah. He said, President Border would like for you to come uh, to meet with him this evening. He said, he knows you're going to leave, be leaving the country tomorrow the next day, and he would like very much to see you. I said, this is crazy. I don't know who Border is. Never seen him. You know, I knew who he was, but I never seen him. So, I peeped through, I said, show me your, your, your stuff and everything. So they showed me all the stuff. You know, I was a policeman at a federal agency, so I didn't know those stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, got, I, I, I said, well, I can't do anything. I don't have none of my guns with me. It didn't have an old blade or nothing with me. Or nothing. <laughs> so I said, let me open this door. So I just prayed. 
I said, Lord, it's in your hands. I have nothing I can do. So I opened the door, and they stepped in. And they said, Mr. Brown, it said, we don't mean to disturb you, but President Borta wants to see you. And they said, he would like if you would come over this afternoon before you leave the country to see him. President Borda didn't meet with anybody. He didn't even meet with his own cabinet. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, he was, I mean, seriously, I'm not, I'm no joke, all jokes are sad. He didn't meet with nobody. So I said, okay. So I called Ms. Uh, Ms. Mandela and I called other people. I told them where I was going. So if I got missing or they killed me <laughs> while I'm over there, you know, everybody knows that I'd been send the U.S. Marines or somebody <laughs> over there to try to get me. So I went on over there. And uh, when I got over there, uh, I found out that Pick Border, who was the number two man in the country, uh, wanted to see me up in his office. So the guy took me upstairs. He, and I saw Pick, and Pick says, Bob, I'm so happy that you're here. He said, uh, what I want to talk to you about is I'm going to take you down to the president's office in a few minutes, but I don't know why he wants to see you and none of my other colleagues. I mean, these are people running the country. None of my other colleagues know why he wants to see you. Now, I'm feeling a little kind of crazy then. Here's the top people. Nobody knows about any of this. And the guys come over there and see me working for President Porter. So he said, I would be forever grateful to you. He said, I'm going to take you downstairs now to, to President Porter's office. And he said, I'm going to ask him if I can stay for the meeting. He said, if I can't stay for the meeting, if he doesn't allow me to stay, he said, I'll be forever grateful if you would come back up here and brief me and my colleagues on what he wanted. Now this is, I'm trying to figure out, I said, something's going on here, I don't know anything about it. I said, Lord, please come down here and help me. So anyway, we got, we, when he took me to President Porter's office, and I walked in there, and President Porter greeted me warmly, and said, Mr. Brown, I'm so happy you're here. I needed to talk to you very bad. And so uh, uh, Pitt asked him, he said, Mr. President, do you want me to stay with you for this meeting? He said, no. I no pick, you going back up to your office. I just want to meet with Bob. That's the way he was talking to him. This is the number two man in the country. He said, no, you going back up to your office. And so we, I sat down and he sat down and we, we stayed there talking to each other, sometimes with a little acrimony uh, for an hour and a half. And I told him, ultimately, it ended up when I told him, he, he started telling me, shaking his finger in my face, saying, uh, Mr. Brown, I offered Mr. Mandela his freedom. He wouldn't take it. He wouldn't take it. And he was just shaking his head and foam coming out of his mouth, shaking his head like that. <laughs> so I said, oh, my God, what in earth am I going to do now? So I just told him, I said, Mr. Mandela is a, is a gracious man. I said, he loves this country, he loves the people here. And I said, he's not gonna come become a free man and he's with all kind of conditions. I said, if, he want, if you wanna be free, get him out of here with no conditions and he don't, you don't need to get along with him. So uh, after that, uh, you know, I went, I went away and he greeted me warmly. He said, anytime you need me, Anytime, anything you want to do in this country, you can do it. He said, I'll sign off on it for you, Mr. Brown. And I said, I appreciate it, Mr. President. And I said, at some point, if I need you, I'll contact you. But then, uh, after that meeting, I wrote a memo and let everybody know, uh, the Secretary of State, the President, and Mrs. Mandela, and the ANC, everybody know. Because I'd never been in a meeting like that before in my life. I'd been, up to that time, I'd been, I thought I'd been to every kind of meeting there was. But I'd never been in a meeting like that. It was incredible. Your, uh, this memo you described uh, was very widely circulated and was it the South African ambassador uh, in Washington said that it might have been coincidence, but uh, about a year to the day that your memo was circulated uh, describing uh, Mandela's 
attitude uh, that the changes began in the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Total, total change. They started having secret meetings with his cabinet, with Borders' cabinet, and, and with Mandela to get his discussion about this, that, and the other. And they, that went on for uh, about a year, year and a half. And then one day, I get a call from Ms. Mandela saying, they're going to release Nelson, and he wants you over here. Well, I had a problem. The problem was that I had just found out that my late wife She was uh, diagnosed. She was and, diagnosed. Uh, you had to stay. I mean, it was obviously the, the right thing to do. And um, she later died from the cancer. Uh, well, she fought for she fought a long a good time. Fight. Yeah. Uh, but, and then, then I sent uh, Stedman Graham and uh, Armstrong Williams. Armstrong has a radio, a TV show, and, and Stedman. And they were both, they had both worked with me for several years, and they had been over there with me before and so forth. So I sent both of them over there to meet Mr. Mandela and tell them what was going on. So the next morning when he got out of jail, they was uh, sitting there and they were having, they wanted, he wanted to have breakfast and they dialed me up on the phone. He told them to get me on the telephone. So they dialed me up on the phone and they, uh, uh, Stedman uh, uh, said to, got on the phone and said, Mr. Mandela's here, he's free, he's at home, and he wants to talk to you. So I picked up the phone and I talked to him uh, for quite a while. He was telling me how good it was to be home and you will know when I'm coming over there. And then he said some people already talked to him about coming to America and I told him I'd wait till he came here. Mm -hmm. And then when he came here, they had a ticket take parade in New York and all that stuff. And then I met him with, in Boston. They bring you up to this real where room, I had to, alone. Yeah. Where I had to, a lot of time with him. Where I had his children in school. So. I hate to do this, but I wanted to get back very uh, briefly to a couple of things in the Nixon administration. Your uh, the policy legacy uh, that you left, and there's so many things. The Office of Minority Business Enterprise, which really created a revolution in. Uh, uh, in, in American uh, enterprise, uh, the uh, aid to historic black colleges and universities. Uh, one thing I'm very interested in, there's a couple of terrific stories, including one where you meet with General West Westmoreland, and you say in your restrained way that you actually went mad dog on him in this meeting. We won't have time, you have to buy, buy the book for that. But uh, that was one of the things that uh, candidate Nixon, uh, when he spoke to you, uh, said that he was very interested in getting your advice and help on race relations in the military That's and right. particularly the advancement of black officers. Can you... Uh, uh, well, there were... Um, that was a huge problem, particularly all the advancement of blacks in the military. You had just a lot of blacks in the military, but they were all at the lower levels, you know, a sergeant or some or lieutenant or something. Uh, but you had men like uh, Chappie James, who became, we, we made him a general and brought him back, as you remember, uh, from uh, over in Libya, and um, gave him a star. And he had been an ace pilot in two wars. Ace pilot in two wars. I don't think there's ever been somebody who's been that decorated and who fought like that in American servicemen. Who, who had remained a colonel and was an ace pilot in two wars. But that was him, he was black, so that was it. So he decided that he wanted to forge a relationship with us. And we said, okay, and we liked him. And uh, so he started telling me what was happening and all this and that nothing else was gonna happen unless uh, we took control of that situation. So I talked to uh, Bob Haldeman one afternoon after that, and, and Bob said he and John Ehrlich were going up to see the president, and, and he thought the president might want to deal with it. So they went in to see the president, and they said they'd call me back within the hour. So they called me back about an hour and a half later and said they had a good meeting with the president, and said the president said what he wanted, what he thought would be the best way to handle that 
is for me to get in touch with the military aid's office, and as soon as, when they would send the papers over to be signed, the president is the commander of everything. You know, no general was going to become a general without the president signing. The promotion list. Yeah, that's right. So uh, when the promotion list would come over, uh, they would send the promotion list to my office, and I would peruse it and find out if any blacks and women and anything on there. So I just give it back to them, tell them to send it on back to the Pentagon. Well, we did that for a few months, and all of a sudden, the heavens opened up. They got the message. <laughs> you know, the message came through, and all of a sudden, you start having all of these people who have served brilliantly in the military. Many of them had been to West Point and everything else. I mean, so there wasn't a qualification thing. They had fought really in wars, but none of them could be a flag officer. So we eliminated that right there. So they got the message, and in the, in the next two or three years, we blacks were all over. And I'd just like to pin something right here. Uh, uh, last month, I believe it was last month, I went to a meeting that was held in Washington at the, at the Wardman, the old Wardman Hotel Auditorium. It was a meeting where they had a lot of uh, military people, all military. And uh, there were many blacks there and a, a number of whites, but it was a, the black group had gotten a meeting together. And I ran into all kinds of black people who had one, two, and three stars. I think there was one that had four stars. And I, I, I mean, and I couldn't help but do not but shed tears because, I mean, I knew what, where we had come from. But this was Richard Nixon who had the guts to do this. And that was a typical kind of Richard Nixon that I knew. That he was, if he decided that it wasn't right and he wanted to do it, he was going to do it. And you better get out of his way because he would slam you in a minute, man. You know? So anyway. Uh, I was in this auditorium with all these people, and one little lady, a black woman, she, just a short little black woman, came up to me, and she said, Mr. Brown, I want to give you my car. She had three stars on it. And she said, I want to give you my car, because at some point I want to uh, get together with you. But she said, I want to thank you. And she said, I want to thank Mr. Nixon for starting all this, for making all this, and she weighed around for making this happen. She said, if y'all hadn't started this, you know none of this would have happened. And this was a three-star general, black woman. So what I'm saying to you is that there were a lot of revolutionary things that happened under President Nixon. And he was a man who had right deep down in him, in his heart. And there, there may have been, there were some things that go wrong and that went wrong, just like it's some things in your home that would go wrong for, in your church or wherever. But he, he stood his ground. And it was because of him and because of what he did and because of he gave many of us the leverage to do a lot of things is why we didn't come down as a country. We didn't go down the train. Because there were many things happening in the Vietnam War that we picked up on. And we don't have time to go into it now, but there were so many different things that happened when we took over that we found out. It was, it was unbelievable. And I don't know if anybody will ever write about that. I don't think I would have the heart. There's to your next that. book. <laughs> yeah. but, in the, but in the meantime, as we take a f few questions, uh, I, I want to thank you for writing this one. Uh, thank you for sharing the story with us, uh, both in the book and here tonight. So, thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Gannon. Uh, Mr. Brown will be happy to sign uh, You Can't Go Wrong Doing Right in the um, Annenberg Court. Uh, the copies are available for purchase in the museum store. I'd like to ask the first question. Um, could you comment a little bit about uh, the desegregation of Southern schools um, in 1969 under the, in the Nixon administration? Uh, that was a very delicate period. Uh, we had um, uh, gotten a word from the Supreme Court as 
uh, Tim Cavanaugh and a number of other guys in here, we were all working together on this thing. And that uh, they were ordering that uh, the desegregation that was supposed to have taken place in 1954, now the, the Supreme Court ruled in 1954, and this was, what, 1970, 1970, 71, something like yep. this? Summer of 70. All these years later, and it, it was they still sacred. It, like, it was like the Supreme Court hadn't said anything. So uh, we got it together, and um, uh, the president named a committee, named George Schultz, chairman of it. And there were several of us on that, and I think, Jim, you were on that committee. Uh, there were several of us on that committee. Uh, and uh, it was our responsibility to make sure that there was not going to be any trouble and get this thing worked out. Well, we went around the country. I personally went around the South uh, and took a fellow by the name of Dr. Tom Hagar with me, who is uh, who was an evangelist, who was the head of IGA, a grocery chain, and he knew a lot of these industrialists because he had been working with them for 30, 40 years. And so he took me in to meet with a lot of them, and I just told him, we're going to have a president want to meet, we're going to have a meeting at the White House, but I'm just telling you before you get there that we are not going to stand for any trouble. If the trouble comes, we're going to put it out, we're going to stamp it out, we're going to stamp out a lot of other things. So we went around, and then we brought each one of those committees that we set up in each southern state, we brought those all of those people to the White House, to the Roosevelt Room, to meet President Nixon. And he wanted to tell him himself, and I won't quote some of the things that he told them, you know. But in other words, he told them that we're not going to have no stuff. That he's going to stuff going to begin and end with him, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, that September when all the schools are opening up. We didn't have, thank God, we didn't have one incident throughout the South, not one incident. And the Washington Post, New York Times, everybody predicted that there would be some, maybe some race riots and this, that, and other. We didn't have one incident, not one. But that was the kind of president that Richard Nixon was. And, and you can believe him if you want to, and you don't believe him at your own peril. Because <laughs> if he said this, we going down this road, don't try to cross him. Because he's going to find a way to take care of you in some kind of way, you know. We have a question right here. Stand. <coughs> Mr. Brown, um, your subtitle in your book is A Child of Poverty, but you've, ri you've lived a very rich life. And uh, in all those years that you've, uh, and, and obviously you, you cherish this country um, and God. Um, I think every generation seems to feel that things are worse than they ever were before, and we hear people say that these days. I think you alluded to that earlier, but looking back in all your years, is it really worse than now? Is it really worse than uh, it has been in the past? Haven't we been in worse situations this country and gotten through it? Uh, yeah, I think uh, there have been times, that, you know, when things have been much worse than they are now. Um, I think we have tried to come together, but we still have some very challenging things uh, that could take our country down uh, several notches. And that's not what we want to do. That's not the American way. We all want to be together. We fight together. We die together. And we want to lift this country up together because this is God's country. You know, we, we are still here. We're here by his grace. And uh, if we go forward, we're going to have to go forward under his banner. And it's not going to be about us sniping at each other uh, for religious reasons or race re uh, reasons or any other reasons. Uh, we try to get together and marshal our forces and have our kids working together so that we can have a better America, a stronger America, so that we can be working together. I think that's what the good Lord wants. That's what I want. And I think that's what most Americans want. We have a question right here. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Thuy, and I am Vietnamese-American. 
And um, I'm glad to see you in person. I drove like two, hour, two and a half hours from Santa Monica with traffic. So, <laughs> uh, but it's worth it, it's worth it. Um, and you know, like, um, you, your story inspired me a lot. I know you don't uh, have time to talk about Vietnam War. That is uh, what i passionate about because I'm young generation and I want to know, like, American view. I don't want media view. I want the view from you, the view from uh, former President Nixon. So my question is, you know, like, when you serve it for him, and you know, like I know, it's a lot of time. It's a, like during the Vietnam War. Um, I want to know, like, how, when did he say something, or when he made decision about Vietnam during the war time? Did he mention anything with you? Did you have a chance, you know, learn something about? Um, his passion, his, you know, like about the war, uh, Vietnam War. Did you, did he talk to you anything secretly about what he did or something <laughs> like that? Because I, I really passionate about my country. As you, you know, I'm, I'm runaway communist, you know, so I really want to know what going on. You know, because we believe in the South, people in the South, we believe it. Former President Nixon, like a re, you know, like bomb, you continue bomb, then it's the, like the North will surrender, and we right now is not like the tragic right now, you know. That is in the South, we believe. So I check one, like, and I do documentary about, um, you know, after the Second Force. So I really, really want to know someone in your time telling us, you know, like, is it your view, you know, like, and president view, you know? That is what I want to know. Well, let me say that um, uh, the Vietnam War was a very difficult, and that's what you're referring to, I believe. Uh, that was a very diff difficult time. In, uh, in America, and everybody was concerned about that. Uh, we had a lot of things to be concerned about then. We were concerned not only about the war itself, but we were concerned about the war that was going on uh, in terms of race relations in the military. That was, a, that was a huge problem for us here in America. That was a problem that was turned over to me early on in the administration. And I worked with that, wrestled with it. We established a special commission, and I sent those folk uh, to Vietnam and all over. It was a five-person commission. Uh, the fellow who worked with Clement Stone, who was his, uh, his uh, right-hand man, he uh, made him the chair of that commission, and they went all over. Uh, uh, about uh, the war and, and trying to see what we needed to do about relationships within our military and with other places. So uh, that's been a concern. That was a concern of the president. That was a concern of, of uh, our different departments and agencies. And, um, you know, I think we brought it a long way in terms of trying to make it right. And that's something you have to continuously work on. That's like a marriage. You're married to a lady, you've got to work on that marriage. You can't say, you can't uh, have the marriage going on pretty good this month, and you say, well, I ain't gonna work on that no more until next year, you know. <laughs> it ain't gonna work. It, you just have to keep it going all the time. You have to keep letting people know that you're concerned, that you can work together and all of that. And coming out of uh, that lengthy war with Vietnam and all the things that happened there. You know, we're still trying to put a lot of those pieces together, but we've come a long way. And we've shown that our hearts and our minds and our interests are together because now you have many American companies 
group going to Vietnam to set up shop. They're operating. Uh, one of the companies that I've been fairly close to the leadership there, the people who own the company, is one of the largest, it is the largest furniture company in the world. And uh, they hire uh, about 12 or 15,000 people in Vietnam. Vietnamese people, an American company. And so there, there are efforts going on that are significant. But we have to keep it going, just like we have to keep massaging relationships in this country. You know, we have all of these problems of, of race and this and, you know, gender and all this stuff. We have to keep working on it. That's nothing that comes automatic. And it doesn't make any, any difference where you are, who you are, what country you're in. The same thing in Africa. Look at all the problems over there. I've been working over there for the last 40 years with the top leadership. Some of them are coming to North Carolina. They'll be there for at least two weeks, me with me next week. And uh, from mainly from the largest country in Africa, Nigeria. And that's the seventh largest country in the world, not just in the world. And so, you know, there are going to be problems. But we have to continuously uh, work to stay ahead of that and to see how we can work together and upgrade the living standards of our people wherever they are, whether they're in Vietnam or whether they're in South Carolina, or Maryland, or California, wherever they are. So that's what we have to do. We have to work together more. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Gannon. Please give both gentlemen a round, another round of applause.